Hello, and welcome to the Premier Advisor Live. I'm Kelly Schimmerhorn, and I will be your moderator for today. Thank you for joining us. We are recording today's call. You will be able to watch the recording by visiting the past events section of premierinc.com forward slash events later this week. That's also where you will be able to find a printable version of today's slides. We have set aside an hour for today's event, and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. You can submit a question at any time by using the question and answer space on the left-hand side of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the program. In today's Advisor Live, participants will develop an understanding for the benefits of destigmatizing failure and a culture of shared responsibility. You'll be able to access methods for creating a culture in which employees are empowered to share feedback. And you'll learn how close attention to the manufacturer's instructions for use and high-level disinfection and sterilization processes can help avoid failures. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Marla Roberts is a director in Premier's Performance Partner Quality and Safety Practice, focusing on regulatory and compliance. Marla has successfully served as a VP and director and has helped serve to build and remodel several procedural and sterile processing departments to meet CMS and the Joint Commission standards. Also joining us today is Mary Oliveira, a Senior Director with Nexera. Mary has over 20 years of experience in numerous roles in healthcare sterile processing, distribution, and materials management. She has also served as a past president of the New York State Central Service Organization. And finally, we're fortunate to have Deborah Amick from Northside Hospital Health System in Georgia, in Georgia joining us today. Deborah is a quality director improvement, in, a director in quality improvement, overseeing the quality of care for three million annual patient encounters. Deborah's health system recently embarked on a project to improve their safety culture. She will provide insights into their experience, as well as some tips to help your organization achieve success. Now, to begin today's discussion, I'll turn it over to you, Marla, to kick us off. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, and thank you all for attending the webinar today. In 2012, Mark Chasen, the president of the Joint Commission, shared an article that simply summed up, stated that when the ongoing journey of quality improvement reaches the end of the road, the next stop should be high reliability. So when thinking about enabling success and high reliability, you must have an understanding of what high reliability is all about. Premier conducted a survey to determine how familiar healthcare professionals are with the concept of becoming a high reliable organization. The study found that 50% have little of any familiarity with the notion of high reliability organization. Almost 60% saw no improvement or a decline in progress toward high reliability. 47.69% found culture and climate as their top challenge, while 70% suggested insufficient information to employees on events regarding errors, near misses, as well as action steps to improve. As the survey results show, many organizations are still working to make progress toward becoming a high reliable organization, which brings us to our first polling question, Kelly. That's right, thank you. We are now going to actually make that polling question live. So as you see the question is on your screen, you may answer at any time, but I'll read the question to you while you're thinking about your answer. What is your organization's top challenge in the pursuit of becoming a high reliability organization? And we'll give a minute as results come in. All right, it looks like we've received quite a few answers. Let's go ahead and turn it over to see what we have. All right, perfect. And so at this point, I will pass it on to Mary to continue our presentation. Marla? Yes, this is Marla. Yes, thank you, Marla. Sorry about that. The results are showing challenges across the board 
including mainly culture and, and climate, which is usually what we see when we do our surveys. Uh, why is the culture of safety so important to us? It's important because the Joint Commission, which accredits many U.S. hospitals and sur surgery centers, issued a safety alert last year about disinfection and sterilization of medical devices in response to a growing, growing rate of noncompliance. In 2016, the Joint Commission cited 60% of accredited hospitals for noncompliance and 74% of all immediate threat to life citations from surveyors related to improperly sterilized or disinfected equipment. Of the many mock surveys conducted by the premier regulatory team since January 2018, deficiencies in sterilization and high-level disinfections have been noted in every facility. So how do we combat this? We have five steps on our roadmap to implementation. The first step is building the foundation with governance and leadership. You have to know that you are following the best evidence-based practices that are out there. And to do that, you need to keep up with selected journal articles, um, have some board engagement with education sessions for them. And make sure that you have leader webinar education sessions as well as a vision to define a future with zero harm. The next step would be comparing yourself to your industry's best practices. The ORO 2.0 is an online organizational assessment that Joint Commission put out with resources designed to guide hospital leadership throughout the high reliability journey, specifically within the areas of leadership commitment, safety culture, and robust process improvement. The discoveries made throughout the ORO 2.0 process help organizations identify their high reliability maturity level and opportunities for improvement. A detailed summary report complete with resources help further the organization's maturity level. So why should we use the, two point, the ORO 2.0? It allows senior leaders in a hospital to evaluate their readiness for and advancement toward a high reliability and the goal of zero preventable harm. Mm -hmm. And it also provides crucial leading indicator information about strengths, opportunities, and potential investment strategies for achieving performance. It also provides references and tools that will help users learn more about high reliability and healthcare. And it is complementary to Joint Commission domestic customers and separate from accreditation. Joint Commission surveyors also do not have access to your data that you, you put into the ORO 2.0. It's just simply your roadmap. Third, we need to communicate and educate. We have to understand the culture, define our desired state, and we want to communicate widely throughout a variety of mechanisms. Adult learners need to hear things seven different times in seven different ways. So you need to be creative in the communication plan because you have visual learners, you have oral learners, you have verbal learners, and you have um, physical learners. Have you ever noticed that people use their hands more than usual when they speak? They always seem to be in motion and always have some form of physical movement, like a conductor in their words. These individuals are physical learners, and they express themselves in the same way. Logical learners are the ones who are always making lists, getting organized, and trying to find the link between one piece of the puzzle and others, where social learners are natural group workers and are the kind of students who seem to be everywhere. And then, last but not least, you also have your solitary learners. Some people think that they're shy or sometimes rude because they often teach to themselves and they may come across as introverted, introverted. But they're more comfortable serving out problems on their own. After you've successfully identified your leaders, train, 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 and hold people accountable to high reliable standards. You also need to have an analytics measurement. So with your data governance and your transparency, you want to make sure that your performance and metric boards tell your unit story. So surveyors know where you are, what promoted a need for change, what you are changing, what you're doing to make those changes, and where you are in that process. So when the surveyors go around with your staff, your staff should also be able to walk a surveyor through your quality improvement board, describe your journey to becoming a high reliable organization, and speak to what you're doing to make those changes within your organization. And the last step is um, capacity building. 
you need to implement your, what you, your process changes. Again, in capacity building, we want to ensure we build in accountability for results. Process changes for an OR director can also include procedural areas such as endoscopy, cath lab, and interventional radiology as our roles expand. Then we want to spread and sustain, and by that I mean hardwire our new processes. Achieving high reliability takes essential elements, leadership, a culture of safety, robust process improvement, patient and family-centered care, and data and high reliability focus. It takes leadership from the C-suite down to the director level. It takes a culture of safety that is hardwired throughout the perioperative and procedural areas. Premier has worked alongside of perioperative leaders to teach new processes, such as helping to implement the 4S process for transporting instruments to STD, as well as take a hands-on approach and assist with remodeling to attain a dirty to clean pathway and ensure staff are properly trained in the perioperative, procedural, and sterile processing department. It takes constantly measuring where you are in patient safety and care and where you are heading to provide the best evidence-based patient care available for your patients and their families. It also includes measuring data so that there is a focus on becoming a highly reliable organization that is providing safe quality care to the patients in your community. And the key is to maintain a state of continuous accreditation readiness. Premier has the accreditation readiness network for subscription so that facilities learn through outcomes of surveys of other hospitals by webinar sharing, training classes, and question and answer boards to aid them in continuing their own journey to becoming a high reliable organization. This leads us into our next polling question. Kelly? Yes, and thank you, Marla, for those wonderful words. At this point, again, we'll invite the audience to engage. I'll read the question on your screen, and you can answer. Rate your agreement with the following statement. My organization promotes a culture of speaking up without fear or retribution. And it looks like we're having responses come in. Great. All right. We'll continue and appreciate everyone's contribution so far. And again, thank you, Marla. At this point, we will, in fact, transition it to Mary to continue the presentation. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you for joining us today. Marla spoke a little bit uh, about the newsletter that the Joint Commission published uh, in a safety alert, highlighting the issues that they find when they do their surveys regarding sterilization and high-level disinfection. And as we go through many of the hospitals to do assessments, we find that these issues have not decreased, but indeed continue to happen. One of the issues that we see that have become or has remained number one is the point of use cleaning. The OR sending instrumentation to the uh, central sterile department with excessive bio burden and exposing the sterile processing technicians to this bio burden. Uh, it is not like we are going to have a decontamination process happening into the operating room, but we have to remove the bio burden and prepare those instruments utilizing the uh, enzymatic solution before those instruments are sent into the uh, um, sterile processing decontamination area. This is one of the processes that have been the most difficult to change and it is because of the number of people that are involved in the process, operating rooms, sterile processing, transporting, and so on. Um, Another issue that we find that uh, has been very permanent is the adherence to the manufacturer's instructions for use. It is very important for the technicians to be able to know how uh, an item is cleaned, how an item is uh, decontaminated uh, and sterilized. Way back, and when I started in sterile processing, we got new instrumentation, and if we didn't know how to do it, what we did was, of if we don't know how to sterilize it, gas it. And that was the perfect answer, and nobody really um, took any offense on how that process 
was done. But today, because the instrumentation is so complex, we have endoscopes that have so many um, uh, ports, so many things that need to be cleaned. The process is very intense. We need to adhere to what the recommendations the manufacturer is giving us. So how, how can we, um, my slides are moving. <laughs> so another thing that we um, find is the uh, documentation and the deficiency in getting those documents according to what the process should be. Uh, we see that the policies are one thing and what the uh, technicians are performing or the tax they are performing, they're not in sync with what the policy or the document is saying that they are doing. When we ask where is the uh, equipment preventive maintenance documentation, a lot of times they say, oh, Biomed has those documents. When we ask Biomed, then Biomed says, oh, we don't have that documentation. So if your facility has another department that is in charge of those documents, you need to kind of find out if indeed they have the custody of those, those documents just to ensure that when an accrediting agency comes in and asks you for those documents, you can provide them. So how can we change and how can we make uh, changes within our own organization? We need to create a transparent culture. Uh, we need a culture in which we have our technicians, our staff, encouraged to speak up whenever they see a problem. This is how we're going to be able to avoid having major incidents and major situations in which patients may, may get to be contaminated by instrumentation that hasn't been properly cleaned or sterilized. If we allow those employees or technicians to be able to contribute to the process improvement, of the organizations, they're going to feel ownership and they're going to feel that if there is a problem, they can come up and discuss that issue and potentially help you find solutions for those problems. So how can you do that? Well, we have to hold frequent meetings. And in those meetings, we need to discuss what are those issues, what are those mistakes, what caused the error, how can we make sure that that error doesn't happen again, and what role that technician or those technicians had in, uh, in the process that contributed to that error. We need to develop a teamwork environment so people feel that they play a role in making things better and who best can give us uh, solutions and uh, suggestions, but the people who are there doing this job on a daily basis for uh, a number of hours. So um, how can we begin to uh, rectify the issues that we have in the organizations? Well, before we do anything, we need to identify what, where are those locations in which high-level disinfection and sterilization is being done. Many of the organizations have centralized sterile processing areas, but in many organizations, there are um, smaller satellite areas or office spaces in which high-level disinfection and sterilization is being done. Well, we need to know where those um, locations are, and we need to perform a comprehensive risk assessment in those areas. We need to know what processes are being done in those areas, what are the medical devices that are either being high-level disinfected or uh, sterilized, whether they are scopes, probes, equipment, instrumentation. Then we need to figure out who are the people who are uh, performing this task and what are the competencies these people have. Uh, once you um, have determined that, now you can begin to see what are those areas that are vulnerable within that high-level disinfection and sterilization process. So it doesn't stop there because now you have identified the locations, you identified what they, what they do, what items they are uh, sterilizing, what are the competencies, but we also need to look at what is the space, the physical de design that is in those areas and whether or not that space is adequate for the processes that are being performed in, in those uh, locations. Uh, we got to make sure the fo functional workplace, uh, uh, the functional workflow is correct 
and uh, and that is it is in compliance with OSHA requirements. We got to make sure we have adequate equipment. If you're doing high level disinfection, do, do you have the uh, appropriate equipment that is going to help you clean those instruments and high level disinfect those instruments? And Joint Commission and accrediting agencies are putting a lot of focus on um, quality audits and having those tools for those technicians to ensure they inspect those instruments, including lumens, to ensure that there is no biomet burden left sent to the operating room or to those procedure, procedural areas. So all of these um, factors come into place Sterilization and high-level disinfection is a very complex process. There are multiple steps. There are instrumentation that requires to be disassembled. There are um, many little things that have to be done in the process. And this is a process that evolves with every new instrumentation that we have. And in the last few years, we've had so many changes that uh, it requires specialized skills and training in order to be successful. We need to have qualifications and we need to have responsibilities defined for those people who are performing the critical task as well as the frontline supervisors. The uh, Joint Commission would be looking for those competencies for every single one of these employees, not only the initial uh, competencies, but also as well ongoing um, training and competencies. Everything needs to be documented and no one, no technician should be performing a task who he or she has not been fully trained to perform that task. And when new equipment, new instrumentation, a new tray or a new process or processes change, we need to retrain the staff, we need to document that training and we need to document For success is we need to make sure that we give those individuals who are giving uh, uh, this service to the uh, surgical areas instructions for use. You can't bake a cake unless you have the recipe with the ingredients and the amount of time that cake needs to be in the oven. So it is the same with surgical instrumentation. You need to know how to clean it, you need to know how to package it and you need to know how long it needs to be in that oven in order to, um, to be a sterile package. They have to be also available to the technicians. We go to a lot of places in which they have a beautiful book, but that book is put away somewhere in an office in which the technicians do not have access and, and it is locked up after hours. So that book needs to be uh, in the work area and in the uh, in, uh, some, somewhere in the decontamination area, they have to be able to access those things. The policies and procedures have to be up to date and they need to reflect evidence-based guidelines to give those technicians in order for them to reprocess those instruments accurately. And again, they have to be accessible to the staff. Process record keeping. Well, all of the documentation that we have in sterile processing are legal documents, just like a medical record for the patient in the operating room, in the patient care areas, we document their progress. The same way we need to document every single item that we process in uh, sterile processing. Um, they are legal documents. We need to maintain them, we need to have them available. We need to do quality audits and document that we are indeed um, checking those instruments, inspecting those instruments, so when it goes into the, um, the uh, procedure areas, those instruments are free of microorganisms and bio burden. Equipment maintenance records, they have to be um, up to date, and staff competencies, they have to be up to date, and everyone needs to be trained. So if we, at least these things, including um, looking at the full process from the OR into sterile processing, if we put these things into place, at least it'll give you um, a, a chance to be ahead of the game and have a successful um, accreditation. At this point, I'm going to invite
the moderator back so she can um, give us the next polling question. Yes, and thank you, Mary, for the insight that you have provided. And yes, we invite the audience to participate again. Please rate your agreement with the following statement. My organization informs all employees of events regarding errors and near misses, including event analysis, trend identification, and action steps to guide improvement activities. And again, we're seeing the polling results come in. So we'll go ahead and a lot of people are responding. I think we'll go ahead and reveal those results now. Uh, there we go. We see them on our screen. Okay, good feedback. And actually at this point, we'll transition the presentation to Deborah to carry us through. Deborah, on to you. Kelly, thank you. So um, my name again is Deborah Amick, and I'm the Director of Quality Improvement for Northside Hospital Health System. And I just want to give an overview, um, kind of tying together what Marla and Mary spoke about, um, and show how Northside um, has been implementing these um, various concepts into real-life practice. Um, so first, I just want to give you a quick overview of, of who we are as a health system. Uh, some of the challenges that, that we felt, and it looks like many of you feel the same according to the first poll that we took. Um, some of the processes that we put in place to overcome the challenges. And then what were the outcomes um, of all the work that, that we did. So first of all, Northside Hospital Health System consists of three not-for-profit hospitals. We're located in Atlanta um, and some of the northern counties of Atlanta. And we have a total currently of 959 licensed beds. We also have over 200 affiliated outpatient centers and medical office buildings, and those are located at this point throughout the state of Georgia. We have nearly 2,900 physicians on staff and more than 15,000 employees, and we have 3 million patient encounters annually. Um, a quick uh, overview of some of the, the highlights of our system. Um, we are full service acute care facilities. We offer particular expertise in maternity, women's health, cancer care, surgery, and radiology. And some of our um, special statistics that we like to highlight, um, Northside delivers more babies than any other single community hospital in the United States. That's our Atlanta campus. Um, we also diagnose and treat the most new cancer cases in Georgia. We're among the top five programs in the United States. And we diagnose and treat the most breast cancer cases in the southeast. We're among the top five programs in the U.S. Uh, Northside treats the greatest number of cases of prostate cancer and GYN cancer in Georgia, and we're ranked fourth in the world for overall robotic surgery volume. Um, another of our um, oncology accomplishments, we have the best survival rates in the country for bone marrow transplants, and we perform more same-day joint replacements at our Forsyth campus than any other Georgia hospital. So among um, everything that we do very well, we, as many of you, um, found that we had a challenge uh, to improve our safety culture. Um, I think that every healthcare system's goal is to provide high quality care. And we identified that we really could um, improve our culture of safety, with, which undergirds all of the quality improvement um, efforts that we have. And so we really used both internal data and external um, challenges to decide uh, to further improve our safety culture. One of the internal opportunities um, that we found, we um, annually use the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Survey. And um, we found that staff really needed to have a broader understanding of patient safety um, concerns and process improvement methods, and then we also needed to have more transparency and quicker communication about potential issues so that they could be investigated. Um, I'm sure many of you have large complex um, environments and transparency and speed um, is essential. 
We also realized that on internal QI tracers, um, we felt that many of the quality leaders organizationally understood um, the necessary components um, to have safe processes and practices, but at the sharp point of care, the frontline delivery staff um, needed to have some more training about um, our internal processes. And then we've had increased growth and complexity as a system. So um, just to give you an example, in 2010, we had about 680,000 patient encounters, and now in 2017, we had um, just under 3 million patient encounters. So we've experienced rapid growth as a health system over the past um, six to eight years. Also, though, externally, uh, Joint Commission accreditation challenges uh, require really a comprehensive integrated approach, and um, there has been a change in the scoring methodology for Joint Commission, um, and so they have changed to what they call the safer matrix, um, and they have changed their methodology so that it's more of a C1, Site 1 um, scoring methodology, whereas previously some of the scoring was based on, um, you know, the how many times they would see something. So overall, what that has done, according to Joint Commission, their findings are overall up about 50% per organization on average. Also, as both Mary and Marla mentioned, there's a heightened focus on infection prevention findings, and 70% um, of hospitals then have been receiving CMS condition level findings during a Joint Commission survey. And so, as you know, um, the accrediting bodies are the deeming bodies for CMS, and we're required to be in participation with the conditions of participation. And a condition level finding, uh, you know, means that we are outside of um, those conditions of participation, and that requires a follow-up survey by uh, the deeming body to ensure that those issues have been resolved. Also, externally, um, all three of our hospitals were due for our Triennial Joint Commission survey with over 100 sites to be surveyed in 2018. So the solution to those challenges that we identified uh, really was further embarking on our journey towards becoming a high reliability organization. And there's some key things that Northside did to really help move the organization forward. And they are based on Joint Commission's model of high reliability. And as you can see um, by the diagram on the left, those are based on leadership, um, which really drives uh, the engagement and helps to create kind of the burning platform from which the organization then can uh, get the motivation and focus that is required to change some of these um, practices across a very complex system. So for us, that meant that we made continuous readiness and infection prevention organizational priorities. And those, um, you know, as all organizations, we have a lot of competing priorities, but these became clearly at the top of our uh, priorities over the last few years. We communicated those priorities clearly throughout the organization, and then really leadership provided resources so that the expectations were clear, but then the support was there in order to accomplish um, the expectations set forth. And then from a performance improvement standpoint, um, we typically stick to the Plan, Do, Check, Act performance improvement methods and we chose uh, continuous readiness, again, because we had our Joint Commission surveys um, looming, and sterilization and high-level disinfection. And so we really focused our performance improvements efforts um, on those three areas. And then underpinning it all is our culture of safety. Um, and we used uh, many different tools, such as assessment. I mentioned the AHRQ survey. I'll go into a little more detail on that education on safety practices that we could spread um, to ensure that more frontline staff were engaged, competency to ensure that the domains of safety um, were adequately um, in place, 
and then further implementing a just culture. So looking for those system issues, holding people accountable where needed, but then also realizing that there is um, human error at places, in place as well. So from a leadership perspective, um, our leadership, as I mentioned, we made continuous readiness and infection prevention organizational priorities. And we took internal data, um, external expectations, and the accreditation landscape to realize that um, this had to be one of our top priorities as an organization. Um, and we made the strategic decision to prioritize safety and continuous readiness. Um, so we felt that preparing in advance for our surveys and um, enhancing our safety culture ultimately is the right thing for the patients um, and would save us time, money, and effort in the future as well. So as I said, we communicated those priorities clearly. We set goals. Um, and uh, senior leaders then were held accountable for their areas of responsibility. We also used transparency and communication uh, to, to talk about our progress towards the goals. Um, and as I mentioned before, we also provided resources. So over three years from a staffing perspective, we realized that to accomplish our goals of increasing safety and processes, we really needed to add um, human resources in our infection prevention department. We added um, SPD experts um, and industrial hygienists and some quality coordinators in our sterile processing department as well as specialized staff. And then in high-level disinfection, we utilized an, an internal expert um, to assess high-level disinfection across the system and to help us develop processes. We also realized that we needed to um, implement new equipment, upgrade equipment, um, and then we implemented IT solutions. So from an uh, audit monitoring um, standpoint, we needed some automatic electronic monitoring, monitoring tools to communicate widely. We also implemented quality dashboards, and then we utilized external experts, and two of them are co-presenters today. So we had um, various staff from Premier come in to help us do mock surveys and infection control and high-level disinfection evaluation, and then provide some interim support. Um, and then lastly, leadership really prioritized the time requirements that it would take um, for various leadership calls and meetings, um, giving staff time to perform tracers, and complete action plans. So what this really looked like um, for performance improvement, if we look at uh, our continuous readiness process, um, from a planning perspective, uh, we wanted really to enhance leadership accountability and transparency and to know that you can trust um, what people say, but you also have to verify and report those those things out. And then we set specific goals to improve staff engagement and continuous readiness. Um, and then what we did, we instituted weekly unit-based tracers. Um, we divided, excuse me, let me push, push this forward here. We divided uh, Joint Commission standards into 12-month rotations. Um, and each month we assigned a certain tracer to every single surveyable location across our organization. We also have environment and care tracers, national patient safety goal tracers, and then we have weekly calls with each of our departments across the organization on one call per campus um, in which we go through the results of the tracers, um, talk about um, efforts across the board, any education that's needed, policy changes, new equipment, and so forth. And then we also provided um, standardized education and training on uh, tracer methods and standards. And then for checking, we really traced alongside with staff too. So our quality department would come shoulder to shoulder with the various units and uh, train, coach, and guide them. And then on the calls, we would have additional coaching and training. 
we also compared units, and we did that, again, with uh, transparency on the um, weekly uh, tracer calls in which we would discuss challenges that we're having across units and then celebrate victories, and we could cross-pollinate those victories. And then we would look for um, areas of noncompliance. And when, if something was a system-wide issue, we would roll those into multidisciplinary teams that often then had to develop policies and procedures um, and work on things offline to bring back to the organization. Um, then we would implement those things across the board. So on our high reliability journey as far as sterilization, again, we utilize plan, do, check, act, performance improvement methods. And um, we research best practices for sterilization. Um, again, we utilize internal experts to help guide those processes. Um, some of those were the, the new human resources and infection prevention that we hired. And then we also utilize the external experts, um, again, including Premier, to help us identify best practices. So what we did on our journey, we centralized sterilization functions wherever possible. Um, we realized that decentralization was harder to standardize, and um, we also standardized competency assessment. At times, we had to retrain staff and just make sure that across the board we had the same competency levels. We provided a lot of education to staff. Um, and also formed a tri-campus sterilization council. Um, this was to um, detail large action plans so that as issues surfaced, they could be added to the action plan and um, then we would have a broader forum in which to share those actions that were needed. We also purchased enhanced equipment. Um, we had to remodel several of our SPDs. Um, and we based our equipment purchases on the capacity demand from time to time so that operationally it would really work for us as an organization. Um, and then from a checking perspective, we um, implemented SPD and sterilization tracers that are very in-depth. So those are based on the Joint Commission sterilization booster packs. The Infection Prevention Department would perform those mo monthly. We also have internal tracers that our staff do. And we developed sterilization dashboards that are pushed out to the Sterilization Council. We also implemented ATP testing of trays and um, quality checks. So there are staff members now who perform quality checks on um, the processes as well as the output of our SPD department. And then we took action. So based on those quality checks and our ATP testing and so forth, we provided additional education where needed, changed policies and procedures, and then we really encouraged, tracked, and celebrated the number of staff certified. That may be certified um, in SPD, certified um, in quality, or certified in their area of specialty. And then from a high-level disinfection perspective, um, again, we centralized scope reprocessing and storage where possible. As um, Mary said, one of, those, one of the issues we had was um, figuring out exactly where all the probes were across the organization, what the processes were for cleaning those, and then um, standardize those processes. We also utilized trophons as much as feasible. So where we could put those in place and get rid of manual reprocessing of ultrasound probes, we did that. We moved to disposable products when possible. And uh, as I mentioned before, we utilized a leader as an internal high-level disinfection expert who is our director of high-level disinfection and helps us across all our campuses and locations to centralize and standardize those processes. Um, in the course of all that, we had to reassess competency and retrain um, and then purchase enhanced equipment. We also are doing ATP testing there and some advanced testing on some of our other scopes um, after they have been um, high-level disinfected as well. And then we also uh, developed high-level disinfection tracers 
that are done monthly, and we have internal HLD tracers that the staff performing those things um, perform. I mentioned we implemented ATP testing of scopes. Um, and then as we do those tracers and watch our processes, we again provide additional education, change policies as needed, and provide additional equipment and training if that is needed. From a culture of safety perspective, um, we realized that on one of the questions in the AHRQ survey, uh, we really had some room for improvement, and that was whether staff feel free to question the decisions or actions of those with more authority. And that appears to be um, a very good question to assess your culture of safety. So in 2016, 66% of our staff answered that they did feel free to question the decisions or actions of those with more authority. And we implemented um, quite a few things that we'll talk about here, including education competency, um, encouraging a just culture, and then being preoccupied with failure. And on our 2017 AHRQ survey, we were 73% um, up from 66% the year before. So from an educational perspective, um, we utilized uh, various methods. We utilized team steps um, to really work on our team communication skills. We also worked on verbiage to give to staff members um, to express their concerns, and that's using the CUS methodology, which is I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, or this is a safety concern. Um, so that staff have words readily available that they can voice um, their concerns if they see something. We brought in national speakers to address the organization on the safety culture. Um, we have implemented um, a patient safety champion training uh, and program. And one of our goals this next year is to enhance communication between providers and other healthcare personnel. And then from a just culture, we really encouraged and talked about at length in various um, locations, encouraging incident reports and the importance of those. We also utilized various forums to celebrate near misses and good catches. And then we uh, perform more RCAs now on near misses, so moving away from just uh, looking at actual incidents to uh, really digging into near misses. And then developing more of a preoccupation with failure. So utilizing those continuous audit processes and leadership rounds to help us point out further opportunities for improvement. So looking at some of our results, um, on our AHRQ survey in 2017, there's an additional question. Staff will freely speak up if they see something that will negatively affect patient care. Um, in 2013, our results on that question were 79%, and in 2017, we were up to 88%, with the national average being 77%. And then another question on the AHRQ survey is, we are actively doing things to improve patient safety. Um, in 2013, we were at 85%, and uh, last year we were up to 91%, with the national average being 84%. And then also I'm very pleased to say that um, in the last seven months we did have all of our triennial surveys um, and we did not have any condition level findings, which again 70% uh, of organizations have, unfortunately. Um, we did not have any widespread findings or high risk findings at any of our facilities. And uh, two of our hospitals actually had fewer expected findings from their previous survey, despite the more rigorous scoring methodology. So looking at the overall national trend for there to be 50% more findings, two of our organizations had less than that, um, and one organization actually had fewer findings than their triennial survey um, before that. And with that, um, I will turn it back over to Kelly. Yes, thank you, Deborah. And in fact, thank you, Marla, Mary, and Deborah, for your wonderful thoughts and insights throughout today's presentation. Um, we have begun receiving questions, but I will reiterate to the audience that we are now ready to take your questions. 
um, and answers, uh, which you can again do through the webinar home screen. I'll say that if we don't get to your questions during our time today, we will follow up after the call uh, by email. Uh, but now we'll, we'll head into our first question, uh, which is for Marla. Uh, how can an organization join the Accreditation Readiness Network? Yes, Premier has um, the Premier Accreditation Readiness Network, which we also call the PARN, uh, where we do our sharing and, and, and whatnot. You can, there is an email link to me at the end of this presentation with my email address, so just shoot me an email. All right, thank you, Marla. Thank and you. And now, on to the next question is for Deborah. Uh, Deborah, who completes the weekly unit-based tracers, and can you also define what you mean by a tracer? Sure, absolutely. Um, let me first define a tracer. So we um, basically tracers are audits that generally follow a process or a patient um, through their care. So we may look at, um, for example, blood transfusion. So we would start from um, the blood consent, the ordering of the blood, um, obtaining the blood from the blood bank, hanging the blood, and then appropriate documentation and so forth. Or, um, you know, it could be of an area. So, for instance, our environment of care tracers are general things um, that we want our staff members to look at every single week. So that could be, um, are there ceiling tiles that are damaged, for instance, or are the PM stickers on equipment up to date, that type of thing. Um, and who performs them? They are generally um, unit-based um, people that have been assigned by their managers to perform those. Um, and then we use an online um, software that helps to aggregate all the information and, and create dashboards for us. Okay. And in fact, there's another question for you, Deborah. How long was this journey from the beginning to sustainability? For example, was it one year, two years? Please share. Sure. Um, you know, I would say we are still on the journey to sustainability. Um, I feel that that is uh, constant and never ending. Um, I do think in some areas, uh, there are things that are just more hard-baked than others, um, but I don't think you can ever completely rest on, you, you know, your laurels of being, um, feeling that you have uh, arrived. Uh, with that being said, we have really been working extremely hard on this for the last three years, um, and some before that, uh, but, but a very concerted effort over the last three years. Very well stated. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like uh, there's another question. It speaks to how did you reimburse your SPD staff for certification? Were they allowed to utilize tuition reimbursement for this? Or perhaps they were just paid? And would you mind sharing from what budget? <laughs> Well, I am not directly over SPD. I do know that Northside in general does reimburse for certification, um, and there is a separate bucket from tuition reimbursement. Um, and so I can get more information on exactly how we did that for SPD, um, but I'm assuming it's the same way. Okay, perfect. And yes, of course, as we mentioned, anything that we don't get to today we'll be sending up via follow-up, and so we can, we can share that as well, uh, Deborah, as you mentioned. Uh, a question came through for Mary. Uh, Mary, how often should we do APT testing? Thank you. Um, every time we do or we wash a scope, we want to make sure that um, that scope is free of microorganisms and bio burden before we put it into the high level disinfection. So we're going to do inspection on all aspects of that scope, including the ATP. That will give you some um, 
uh, uh, numbers, uh, your, your facility will determine what are acceptable numbers and uh, it's, it's an indicator that you can move on to the next step, high-level disinfection. But um, you should be doing all of your scopes. Thank you, Mary. This next question is something that perhaps all of the presenters could think about, but I will start with you, Deborah. Do you have any suggestions on building trust with staff as you transition away from a punitive culture and encourage the reporting of near misses? Um, you know, I do have some suggestions. I think it starts with education on um, a just culture and the fact that there really are different buckets of, of behavior and things that can um, go into uh, an adverse outcome. And those include um, a system failure, so the system may be designed in such a way that we are not setting people up for success. Um, and then there can be human error, um, simple oversights, um, and the, really the system needs to be designed with that in mind. Um, then there are times that um, it is not human error, but it's someone choosing to um, ignore uh, the safety checks that have been put in place. And in those cases, you know, there, there is room for disciplinary action. So I think uh, establishing that framework, first of all, helps. And then really, in public ways, um, celebrating near misses and good catches and um, encouraging people to come forward with those and then sharing how those have been resolved. Thank you, Deborah. And I'll just check to see Marla or Mary if either of you wanted to add anything in this last minute. I always think when, when it comes to your employees, too, in the sterile processing and perioperative areas, that leading by example, getting in there and actually working with your staff, answering the questions, that helps to build the trust between the director, the manager, and the staff. Um, I also always encourage that wall of fame is what I like to call it, where you're actually encouraging those SPD workers in states where it's not mandatory that they be certified to go ahead with that training and get their certification and be proud of that. And so I would always frame their certificate up there and then track that with a board, you know, um, underneath it for quality metrics. You may get a gold star for not, for not having any misses, you know, come back trays that weren't uh, complete or trays that had issues with them. And most people are tracking these through, you know, the electronic instrument tracking system. So it's easy to pull those reports and to, you know, like Deborah said, you want to celebrate, you know, their success and make them feel empowered also to, to have that trust to come to you and say, hey, you know, this happened. I recognize that this happened and this is what I did about it, but I wanted you to know. So then that way you can help them and coach them and train them and guide them, you know, to, to uh, not have those future near misses. Thank you, Marla. I, and um, Kelly, uh, I'd like yes. to add something to that. Um, it's been our experience that whenever we've gone into a facility and, and we begin to incorporate the staff and include them in the performance improvement process, they get empowered by, hey, we've never been asked, we've never been included, and their attitude completely changes when they, um, they begin to give us um, suggestions, they become part of the process, and they take ownership of the process. Also, when, when you start sharing those key performance indicators uh, outcomes and how well they're performing and, and what are those numbers, it, it changes the whole tune in that um, department, and it becomes more positive. They want to learn, they want to enhance their skills, and they want to participate and show uh, how well they're doing. Perfect. Well, thank you all for those insights. This has brought us to the end of our time today. Uh, we hope that the program has been helpful, and we appreciate spending time with us. We also ask that you take a moment to answer the brief survey questions and let us know how we can better serve you. 
Of course, our contact information is showing on the screen now if you have any additional questions or feedback about today's event. And again, we will have today's recording posted very soon in the past events section of premierinc.com, and we'll send an email when it's ready. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.